In this video, we're going to begin our discussion about rotational motion. And here specifically, we'll start out by making some basic definitions. Before we do that, let's take a look at the following question. A hoop and a disc of equal mass are released at the top of an incline and roll without slipping. They will reach the bottom at the same time, the disc first or the hoop first. Go ahead, pause the video and think about this for a little bit and then restart the video. So usually when I ask this question in a classroom environment, most of the students think that the disc and the hoop will arrive at the same time. And that makes sense based on what we've learned before in the course. However, it turns out that actually the disc is the one that's going to win the race. In order to understand that, and ultimately in order to be able to figure out something like what is the final velocity for each of these objects at the bottom of the ramp, we're going to have to get into the details of rotational motion. The first thing that we can see here though is that when we're dealing with rotation, it's not just how much mass an object has. So obviously mass is important, but it's also how the mass is distributed. And what I mean by that is if you look at the hoop and the disc, in the problem they've got the same amount of mass. So you might have thought, oh, well, that kind of makes them identical. But of course they're not. All of the hoop's mass is located as far away from its rotation point as possible, where the mass of the disc is more evenly distributed. And it turns out that that makes a difference in terms of how quickly these objects will roll down the incline. We'll see later on that we have to define a new quantity called moment of inertia as kind of the rotational equivalent of mass that's going to take into consideration not only how much mass does an object have, but how that mass is distributed. All right, so let's go and start at the beginning. What I want to make you realize is that we're really just working by analogy here with the work we did at the beginning of the course. When we started talking about motion, remember the first thing we had to do was be able to locate an object in space. And in one dimension, here's what we did. We just drew a number line, set an origin, and we could locate the position of our object with that setup. For rotation, we want to do a similar thing. So if I have an object that is right here and it's rotating around, then I need to be able to specify where that object is. And the way we're going to do that is by using theta. So theta is the angular position and it's the equivalent of regular position in a linear problem. Here I've also reminded you of the definition of an angle in radians. Remember that theta is simply equal to this arc length s divided by this radius r. And that's how we that's how we know that there are two pi radians in a, in a circle. In other words, we know that if we go all the way around, the distance that we cover is 2 pi r. And if we divide that by r, we get that there are 2 pi radians in a circle. So we're going to be measuring our angular position in radians. And we know that 2 pi radians is the equivalent of 360 degrees. The next thing we did when we were first doing this for linear motion was we defined displacement. And we defined displacement to be the final position minus the initial position. Here we want to do the exact same thing when we define angular displacement. Again, angular displacement is going to have units of radians. And we just want to take the final angular position and subtract the initial. So for example, let's say I'm keeping track of a spot on this bicycle wheel. And initially, the angular position is theta 1. And I'm measuring relative to my x-axis here. So the initial position is theta 1. Now let's say at some later time, it's gone all the way 
to this position. So that would be theta 2. And I can see that the displacement, delta theta, is just going to be this. And we can see that delta theta is just the final angle minus the initial angle. So the equivalent of doing this in a linear situation. Once we had the concept of displacement earlier in the course, the next thing that we defined was average velocity. We'll do the exact same thing here. We'll define average angular velocity as the angular displacement per time, just like we define average velocity as the regular displacement per time. Notice we're using a bar to mean average, just like we did before. And we're using the Greek letter omega to represent the angular velocity. Once we had our average velocity defined, the next thing that we defined was the instantaneous velocity. Remember, this is really the origin of calculus, trying to figure out what is the velocity, the velocity at an instant in time when, by definition, velocity involves two times. And so we said that the linear velocity, the instantaneous linear, linear velocity was the limit of the average velocity as delta t goes to zero. And of course, that is the definition of our derivative dx dt. Instantaneous angular velocity, exact same definition. We define it as the limit as delta t goes to zero of the average angular velocity or the derivative d theta dt. Notice that the units of angular velocity are radians per second, because we know that displacement has units of radians. Now, I want to just remind you of something we talked about earlier in the course. In simple harmonic motion, we used omega as well, but we called omega the angular frequency. And if you remember, the unit that we used for angular frequency was seconds to the minus 1. Now you might, you might ask yourself, why are we using the same variable to represent two different things, angular frequency and angular velocity? The reason is because mathematically, as we'll see, they're defined in the same way as 2 pi times the frequency of the motion. It's just that in simple harmonic motion, an object is simply going back and forth, so we call it angular frequency, whereas in rotation, an object is going around in a circle, and so we want to talk about an angle per second, or radian per second. Take a look at the following question. A boy sits at the outer edge of a merry-go-round. So here's our boy out here. And a girl sits halfway between the boy and the axis of rotation. So we'll put the girl right about here. And the question is, the merry-go-round makes a complete revolution once each second. The girl's angular velocity is. Go ahead and pause the video and think this one out on your own, and then we'll go over it together. Okay, this one kind of gets at the heart of understanding why we introduce these angular quantities in the first place. You'll notice that the boy and the girl do not go through the same distance. In other words, if we look at some later time, the girl will have ended up right here, and the boy will have ended up here. So the boy is clearly covering a greater linear distance. However, notice that the angle that they each go through is the same. Remember that omega the angular velocity is d theta dt, or the average angular velocity is delta theta over delta t. If they both go through the same angle in the same amount of time, then their angular velocity is the same. So again, this really gets at the concept of why did we bother introduce some new variable, angular velocity? Well, if you think about it, the reason is because 
the linear velocity is the same for every point on a translating object and that works great when we're talking about things like a car with an initial velocity of 30 meters per second. When we used to do problems like that, it was obviously implied that every point on that car was moving with that velocity. But if we look at an, an object that is rotating, you'll notice that a point on the outer edge is going to go through a much greater distance per time than a point here. But as we just saw in the last example, the angle they go through is the same. So if we want just to be able to give one number to specify the motion of a rotating object, we can't use linear velocity, but we can use angular velocity. So every point on our rotating object has the same angular velocity. Let's say 3 radians per second, just to make up some number. Okay, So that's why we had to introduce this new concept. We want to be able to use one number to specify what's going on when an object is rotating, just like we want one number to specify what's going on when this object is translating. Let's look at the relationship of angular velocity to some other quantities that we're already familiar with. Again, just like in simple harmonic motion, omega is equal to 2 pi f. So in this case, again, it's angular velocity, not angular frequency, but the definition is the same in relation to the frequency. The period is also still related to the frequency in the same way, and therefore the angular velocity is 2 pi over the period as well. Let's look a little bit more uh, a little bit more at the relationship between the instantaneous linear velocity of a point on a rotating object and the angular velocity of that point. So let's say that I've got some point on this rotating object, a distance r out from the center, and this object is rotating around. Let's figure out what the relationship is between the linear velocity of that point v and the angular velocity omega. We know that when something is going in a circle that the velocity, the linear velocity, can be found by just taking the circumference of the circle the object is going through and dividing by the amount of time it takes to go through that circumference, so 2 pi r over the period. But remember, we just said that omega, the angular, the angular velocity, is 2 pi times the frequency, or 2 pi over the period. And therefore, the relationship between the linear velocity of a point on a rotating object and the angular velocity is just v is equal to omega r. And you'll notice this makes sense. We know that the farther the point is out from the center of rotation, the faster that point is going to be moving. And at the center, effectively, it's not moving at all. Let's talk a little bit about units. We've said that the units of omega are radians per second. And we know the units of r would just be meters. So the question is, does that mean that the units of velocity are radians meter per second? Well, obviously, the answer is no. It's just meters per second. So why is it that we can just kind of get rid of the radians whenever we want to? Remember, the definition of a radian was s over r, where s was the arc length and r was the radius. Well, they're both lengths. So really, a radian is not a unit. It really is just something that we use to remind ourselves that we're talking about angular motion. And so whenever we want to, we can simply drop radians as a unit. Let's try the following example. You might want to pause the video and do it yourself first. A computer hard drive rotates at 7.2 times 10 to the third revolutions per minute. What's the frequency? What's the angular velocity? 
and what's the speed of a point on the disk three centimeters out from the axis in meters per second. So by the way, these are realistic numbers for a hard drive that you might find in a desktop computer. Okay, let's go through the answers together. So the first thing that we've got to do is we've got to realize what were we given here. So what is that revolutions per minute? Well, revolution, revolutions per minute is frequency. Remember that frequency is something per time. So cycles per second, revolutions per second, revolutions per minute. But here we're being asked for the frequency in hertz. Remember, a hertz is anything per second. In this case, revolutions per second. So I need to simply convert from revolutions per minute to revolutions per second. I've got 7.2 times 10 to the third revolutions per minute. I know that in one minute, there are 60 seconds and therefore I get 120 revolutions per second or 120 Hertz. The next question, what's the angular velocity? Well, that's easy once I know the frequency because we know the angular velocity is just two pi times the frequency or two pi times 120 which is 754 radians per second. Finally, we're asked what's the speed of a point on the disk three centimeters out from the axis in meters per second. We know the linear speed is related to the angular speed by V is equal to omega R. And here we've got 754 radians per second. For r, since I want my ultimate velocity to be in meters per second, I've got to convert that. So that would be 0.03 meters. And again, here I can just ignore the radians once I make this calculation and say my final answer is 22.6 meters per second. So again, once you're no longer talking about an angular quantity, you just drop the radians. It doesn't have to be canceled with anything else. By the way, um, that's about 50 miles an hour. Uh, so the outer edge of your hard drive is going very fast. Now that we've defined angular displacement and angular velocity, clearly the next thing we want to do is define angular acceleration. So let's first of all review what we know about the acceleration of an object in uniform circular motion. Remember, in uniform circular motion, if an object is going around in a circle, let's say it's going in that direction, we know that there is an acceleration towards the center of the circle. And I'm going to call that AR for the um, radial acceleration, but that's what we call the centripetal acceleration back in uniform circular motion, that acceleration that's along a radius towards the center of the circle. When an object is going in a circle, there is always a radial or centripetal acceleration component. But now we're talking about a more general problem because not only is our object going in a circle, but it might be speeding up or slowing down. So let's say that the object is speeding up. In that case, then, there must also be a component of the acceleration in the direction of motion. We call that the tangential acceleration. And so we have two components of the acceleration. Therefore, the total acceleration is now the vector sum of the radial acceleration and the tangential acceleration. And in this particular problem, if I wanted to kind of draw what the direction of that is, I would say, you know, add the vectors and so the total acceleration would be in that direction. Okay, so the radial component and the tangential component are just two components of the overall acceleration. Notice, by the way, if the object had been slowing down instead, so let me just make a note here that that was speeding up. If the object had been slowing down instead, then AT would have been in that direction. 
and the total acceleration would have been like that. Okay, so we've got those two components, the tangential component and the radial component. If we want to find the total acceleration, then just using what we know of vectors, we know that we could find the magnitude of the total acceleration just by using the Pythagorean theorem. Now the question is, how are these accelerations, the radial and the tangential components of the acceleration, how are they related to what we were just talking about in terms of angular quantities? Well, we define the instantaneous angular acceleration as d omega dt. And of course, that makes sense. That's just working by analogy with the fact that we know the linear acceleration is dv dt. But how does this relate to what we've just been talking about? Well, the angular acceleration is related to the tangential acceleration. So again, let's say our object is going around in this direction, and let's say that it's speeding up so that there's a tangential acceleration like this, and we've got our radial acceleration like that. The tangential acceleration is related to the angular acceleration. In other words, at is equal to r times alpha. Notice that that makes sense too because we've said that the linear velocity is related to the angular velocity in this way. Remember, r is not changing, so if I took the derivative of both sides of that, this is what I would get. Now, if the object is in uniform circular motion, then the angular velocity, omega, is constant and there is no angular acceleration. And that's why when we studied uniform circular motion, there was no tangential acceleration because there was no angular acceleration. But if the object is speeding up or slowing down, as well as going in a circle, then we will get an angular acceleration and a tangential acceleration. Notice that our units for angular acceleration are going to be radians per second squared because we know that we've got radians per second on the top here and seconds on the bottom. In our next video, we'll take these new quantities of angular displacement, angular velocity, and angular acceleration and see how we can combine them together to come up with rotational kinematic equations.